The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Well, if you're a college football fan like us, it's starting to get a little sad because we're realizing that we're already through week 10 of college football. We're going to recap a bunch of big-time games. We're going to go through some of the top uh, top teams and how they performed this past weekend, some of the top matchups, what we liked, what we disliked about all these matchups, all of this and so much more. So stick around today on Rising to the Occasion. Hello, everybody, everybody, and welcome back into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We are so happy to have you here along with us for the ride. Uh, we've got a lot to get to. Like I said, it was a sad weekend just knowing that college football is coming to a close. The, the season's over halfway uh, finished, and, man, we're getting closer and closer to the last week of college football. And, uh, man, it's it's just sad. We've got, you know, the Bulldogs and, and what they were able to do fending off the Tigers. We're going to get to the Bedlam game. We're going to get to Oregon and how much they were able to score this past weekend. And then the Huskies and the Trojans and how that one just turned out to a scoring frenzy. Uh, and then obviously also ending it off with one of the biggest games, one of the biggest matchups of the weekend. And that was Alabama going against LSU Tigers. We're going to recap all of these games. But before we do, we want to let you guys know a little bit of a trick in betting on sports, and that is by going over to FanDuel. All right, you can download the FanDuel app uh, and get signed up for FanDuel. We encourage you to go to rising2.com slash FanDuel, and if you go there, it will automatically give you an amazing promo. You bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. It's an amazing deal. You do not want to miss out on it. It's going to be right up there in the corner off and on throughout the episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that there. It's also going to be down in the description, down in the link in below, uh, a, a link in the description down below. But you can go to rising2, that is R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash FanDuel. You go there and it's going to automatically give you this amazing promo. It's a very easy way to get signed up and it gives you bonus bonus bets that you can you can put this in and win your own real money so i mean it's free house money to earn your own money so why not take advantage of the amazing deal and go to rising2.com slash fanduel and you'll get 150 dollars in bonus bets the promotions may vary based on your location so it may be better it may be worse i don't really know it's just kind of based on how, wherever you're at so if you want to bet on a sports book today and you want to try out FanDuel, get signed up with that one, and it lets them know that we sent you, and it also gives you that amazing promo. So go check it out today. FanDuel is what we've been using all month for our bets, and uh, we're also going to get to our our uh, bet competition that we have here towards the end of the episode, and we'll also bring FanDuel up in that as well. But let me go ahead and bring in my co-host for the evening. I got Jeremy on with me tonight. Jeremy, how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. Had a long weekend, but I'm thankful that I got to catch up on some college football just because obviously, as you guys know, I wasn't able to make it because I had work. But still, just looking at this overall weekend with the college football that we had, I was kind of bummed that I didn't get to see it, but it happens. Got a new job, so I got to, I had to commit to working some weekends. But still, there was a lot of big key games that we were obviously going to be talking about tonight. Like the Georgia-Missouri game was one I was really, really anticipating just because we talked during the week earlier that – number one Georgia against number two Missouri. That was one that we talked about a lot. Then we were really, really looking forward to that game. But obviously even looking at other games like the the Washington USC game, the battle between two great quarterbacks again or one quarterback and a quarterback that I'm not trying to sound disrespectful, but I think is a sore loser. Um but even there's just so many games that were just really, really good this weekend. Obviously, also even talking about Roll Tide Alabama with the LSU Tigers. I mean, just overall, this just weekend was just a phenomenal weekend to watch for football. But, Josh, I know we got a lot of games to cover, so I'm going to cut the chit-chat and let's get rolling with it. Yeah, man, let's get rolling into it. And, yeah, like you said, it was it was a really fun weekend of college football. A lot of really big-time games and a lot of big-time teams that we were really interested in how they're going to close out the season. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that Blake's not able to, to do the recap with us because I wanted to talk about this game with him because he's he's constantly bash, been bashing the Buckeyes. And I'm usually on the same train. I, I was living in Ohio for quite some time, and uh, the people out there know that I love to rag on their Buckeyes. But I've been seeing the Buckeyes, 
And I think this game, and 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 not just this game. I think the, how they've been playing throughout the season. We've seen them go against bigger, uh, bigger opponents and do very well. Like uh, like uh, uh, whenever they went against Notre Dame, being able to pull that one off. Uh, and and we've seen other other opponents that they've been able to take on and do really well. Uh, and and even Maryland, where they were at, at at that point in that game, that that was a really good Maryland team that they were going against originally. Uh, and so, of course, they've fallen off the wagon since. But I, I do think that Ohio State is a very good team. And I, I'm, I'm starting to agree with the Ohio State up at number one based on their resume and how they performed through these games. Because you look at it, I, I think, really, I think Kyle McCord is the reason why their offense is struggling. And, and you can look at their offense and blame their offense for being the reason why Ohio State's just kind of moving a little slow. They're not really looking great. And, and I can I can go right along with that notion. I don't think this Ohio State offense looks very good at all. And and I will put a lot of that blame on Kyle McCord. I don't think they have a guy like C.J. Stroud or Justin Fields uh, or even backing up into the, the older quarterbacks that they used to have, like Braxton Miller uh, and, and you know, the, the guys like that, that where you, you look at Ohio State, they usually always have a good quarterback. They've had such good quarterbacks in the past that they passed up on guys like Joe Burrow. So, I mean, this is this is an Ohio State team that's not used to having this bad of a quarterback room. And I, I think Kyle McCord is where I kind of blame a lot of this this slow production. Uh, you know, he only had 189 yards. He did put in three touchdowns, uh, also turned the ball over once. Uh, you know, and, and Marvin Harrison Jr., he should have more than four receptions. We talk about this guy a lot. He's an electrifying player. I, I, I'll say I think he's the best college football player uh, on the field right now. And, and so I just looking out at my Marvin Harrison and what he's capable of, uh, he did have 25 yards on those four receptions, not much at all. Uh, and or he had two touchdowns on the, on the day. So yeah, he was able to get into the end zone, but you've got to rely on your key receiver more than just four times throughout the day. And Travion Henderson coming back in for, for this offense has really been really big. We talked about him last week and now coming into this week against, against Rutgers, uh, he, he had 22 carries, 128 yards and a, and a touchdown. He also was the leading receiver for these Buckeyes with 80 yards and, uh, the, the reason why I like this Buckeye team is because they've got guys like Travion Henderson who can lift, the, lift them up and, and turn them into a better, pro, a better uh, football team. And so him coming back in, I think that was huge for the Buckeyes. But the, the fact that they don't have to rely on their offense to score a lot. Their offense does do one thing good, and that is not going just three and out or turning the ball over a lot, putting their defense on the field because their defense is phenomenal. Uh, their, their defense looks really good. I think this is why they're ranked number one in the nation in the college football playoffs right now uh, in, in that poll. And, you know, they, they were four for 13 on third down, uh, you know, so that's extremely well for defense to force the Rutgers to only go uh, four for 13 on third downs. And then they only allowed 361 yards, less than 400 yards of offense against a pretty good Rutgers offense. And they were tricky, too. They ran a lot of trick plays, and they do that a lot to the Buckeyes and bigger opponents. Um, but then they also had uh, Jordan Hancock, who came away with a 93-yard pick six. So I look at this Buckeye team, Jeremy. And I really like what I see out of them. I know Blake likes to rag on them, but I'm I'm looking at the Buckeyes. I do think that this is tied for the for the top team. You know, at the very least, I think they're tied for the top team in the nation. Personally, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we've talked so much about Ohio State, but I mean, at the, at the same aspect, like I 100% agree. I definitely think this is a tie for being in the top team. But obviously, like you mentioned, being the number one team in the college playoff poll, but still. You look at Ohio State and what they're just able to bring to the table. Like even look out, uh, look at what they can bring with Marvin Harrison Jr. I know we talk about him a lot, but still, just even outside of that, like their coaching aspect. I know they they talk so much about all the players, but they don't really mention a whole bunch about the coaching staff. Just because you look at what they've done to this organization. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like we always talk about Ohio State just in general, just for the college football team. But still, like you have that kind of a capability to bring these coaches obviously that have been around for a long time and bring this bring this organization in year after year after year and be so successful and that's always a big key thing like like I said a lot of people just look at the players but still you got to look behind that aspect and think of the people that actually bring them in and that's obviously the coaching and the recruiting staff but still I 100% agree like 
like what you said, going against Rutgers this week, that they're no team that you can kind of just cakewalk over. They do a lot of trick things. Like you said, they like to run a lot of traps. They like to run a lot of screens, and they like to they like to really throw off these big teams just so they know that, hey, you might be the number one team in the college AP playoff poll, but still, we're Rutgers, and we can still hang in there. But obviously, still, Ohio State beating Rutgers 35-16. to 16. That's still, like, at the end of the day, I still – I still give a lot of respect for Rutgers and being able to do what they did. I know the score may seem like it seems different, but still, like you got to give a lot of respect to Rutgers and still being able to hang in with Ohio State a little bit. Yeah, I, I think the Rutgers have probably done the best job out of any team that I can really think of all season long in terms of rushing against 100%. this defense. Uh, so I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's it's been. It, it was it was a really fascinating and fascinating game, and a lot of people looked at this game early and were like, "Ah, oh, the Buckeyes are in a close matchup." That's what they've been doing. The the uh, we'll we'll talk about Alabama here in a little bit too, and Alabama's been doing that. I can respect a team that takes your first half and starts it off slow and finishes it off extremely strong, uh, it, as long as you're doing it in a fashion like the Buckeyes or even the Tide are doing. I don't have anything wrong with that. And so a lot of people are, are, are kind of overreacting, in my opinion, to that. Uh, and so I, that's why I would have liked to have, have Blake be able to join us uh, as, as we get into this this game because I, I truly look at this Buckeyes team, and I, I like what I'm seeing from them. Uh, you know, and you've got guys that you can rely on, like Amika Egbuka and, and Marvin Harrison Jr. Travion Henderson having 80 yards out of the backfield as a, re, as a receiver. That's that's amazing right there, and that's then of huge. course, is uh, on top of that is 126 yards or whatever that was on, on rushing too. So, uh, just just looking at this team, I I truly think they have a lot more that they can put together, and I think they play to their opponents a lot, and and that's not a bad thing to do. And I think you rely on that defense the way that they have, and they've been phenomenal in defense. I I don't know of a, of a defense that has been as solid and as consistent as this Buckeyes team really. Absolutely, but I mean. Like going against, like obviously what you said, but Travion Henderson, but even looking like outside, like there are other, there are other Russians. Like I know obviously Chip or even like Xavier only getting maybe two or three touches throughout the entire game for them, but still only putting up for both of those players come I think it was like 11 yards, but seriously, they rely so much on Trayvon Henderson just for this kind of a situation. Like you said, having 128 yards on a game, that's really good for Trayvon Henderson. 80 yards, 80 yards of those, like you said, for rushing, that's really huge. But even yeah, looking receiving. on the other, yeah, receiving, excuse me, but like even looking on the other, other side of the ball for Rutgers, like you look at um like Kyle, I know I'm going to say his last name is, Money hockey. I'm gonna like I said. I'm terrible with names, so please bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. But and you're, you're a hockey 24. player too, so you think you'd be better with names? <laughs> yeah, I know you would think, but the, we get hit in the head with pucks, so it's not that great. But still having 24 carries and having almost 160 yards on the day against an Ohio State defense. That's huge. Like you, you look at some teams that go in against a play in Ohio State. They're lucky to maybe even break 100 yards on rushing. But seriously, like. Like I said, with these Rutgers guys, they're definitely no one to sleep on. So looking at it, I wouldn't well, be I wouldn't be doubting Rutgers. Yeah, and I th- I think you said it well too because I, I think I think this Rutgers team when a lot of pe- a lot of people see Ohio State battling it out with the Rutgers and they're they're in a close matchup like this, man, that's that's crazy. It is crazy because it's Rutgers and you don't think of them as a good team, but don't don't forget that they were six and two coming into this game. This is this is a surprisingly good Rutgers team this year, and I know they're they're not facing the biggest opponents or anything like that, but they're still doing well. And so I, I think we underestimate teams like this at, at times, uh, and so we expect more out of the Buckeyes against a team. And I think they performed and they 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 won the game exactly how you would expect them to, and and what you, what you would want them to do as a number one team. And I don't think I, I'm I'm not knocking Ohio State one bit for for the way that they played against Rutgers. Um, but let's go ahead and jump on to our next one. It's K State at Texas. There were three games uh, that I watched closely, uh, that you know that, that I watched pretty much almost every snap of, and uh, it was this K State Texas game. I mean, I, I I had this one up side by side with the the Husker game because they were going on at the same time, uh, and so I was watching those two. And this K State Texas game was just chaos. Uh, it really was, and and Texas they were up twenty seven to fourteen at halftime, uh, or uh, sorry at the, at the end of the third, and K K State fought back to push it into overtime. Uh, Texas makes the three three point field goal and kind of puts all the pressure on K State, and then K State tries for it all and gets gets you know the the Texas gets pressure on Howard. Uh, he ends up throwing a bad one and he he can't do anything with it. Uh, they go down, they lose the game. Texas wins, uh, and Malik Murphy. This is this is a guy we got to bring up because. 
is is it time for Arch Manning? Because Malik Murphy, he only goes 51% on the day on completion percentage, uh, throws for 248 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions. Uh, it's not very good. And, and K-State really, uh, one thing I will say about Texas I, that I think they did really well on, the reason why they won this game is because I, I was talking about this on Saturday, uh, how this K-State team is a running team. They, they are, are founded on their run game, whether it be on, on the, they're going to use that run game to get their, their pass option, their run pass option going, the RPOs and, and play action, all that kind of stuff. And they're, they're going to utilize that run game. And Texas was absolutely outstanding on defense, holds them to only 33 yards on the ground. So, I mean, just an amazing game from the Longhorns uh, and, and being able to pull it out. And again, remember, they're, they're without their starting quarterback, and I don't think the next best quarterback is in the game. Uh, so, I mean, I, Jeremy, do you, do you think at this point, with, with as much as we've seen from Malik Murphy in these last two weeks, turnover prone, not really doing anything and producing anything, uh, is, is it time to maybe give a, give a little bit of an Arch Manning a, a shot? I sincerely do think so. Like, we obviously talked about this the last time I was on. Like, we were trying to discuss, obviously, without Quinn Nears at QB, what are we going to do? I sincere, I still stick with my game plan here. Like, obviously, now that we've seen Malik Murphy play, and like you said, only being 51% and having one touchdown, two interceptions, that not, that's not really the normal style of text that we say we play. But, like, obviously, like I said, they don't have a starting quarterback. So, I sincerely think going into next week – I sincerely think you give Arch Manning a shot and then see how he compares to Malik Murphy. And then right from there and the get-go, I sincerely think like after that week, see who's going to be your next temporary starting quarterback. Because obviously, I nothing against Malik Murphy, but I'm sorry. like If you go against a K-State team, but still having that kind of a close game and having that big of a lead going to the fourth quarter, than just letting that lead slowly and slowly slip away. Then obviously, like you said, getting into overtime and tying it up. Then, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's at the end of the day, it's still a win for Texas, but that's not the kind of win that we're used to normally seeing out of Texas. We're used to seeing them out of the gate from the get go, just march down the field and not slow up and just keep the ball rolling. But like at this point, I sincerely would try and give Arch Manning a shot just because like you said, like we've obviously seen Malik Murphy play, but now let's see what Arch Manning can do. And right from there, I don't. And also, it does kind of play a little bit of effect, but I don't necessarily know who Texas has for the remainder of the year. I know we talked about it the last time, but I think at the same time, uh, give it a give him a shot, just because if not, I sincerely think Arch Manning might transfer. In my honest opinion, but yeah, that's that's kind of what what Blake's prediction was, uh, and I, I don't know, yeah. I don't I don't see that happening. But here's here's the thing too. Uh, so for the rest of the season, they've got TCU, Iowa State, and Texas Tech, uh, three teams you don't want to take lightly. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, here, here's the thing. So let's say because I don't think Quinn Ewers sticks around after this season. I, I would imagine he goes to the NFL. Maybe because of his injury, he wants to stick around one more season. I don't know. Uh, that that could be the case, and then if that's the case, I could definitely see Arch Manning transferring. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I wasn't taking that into consideration when we talked about that before. But let's say Quinn Ewers does move on, whether transfer goes to the, to the NFL. See, you you've got Arch Manning this year. If he loses his red shirt ability, which gives him an extra year of eligibility, does that really matter in the long run, or is he only going to play three seasons for you, two or three seasons for you, anyways? So I mean that that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. Do you just go ahead and say play, kid, uh, and and realize that he's only going to give you two and a half, three years at the most, anyways, and then probably be ready for the NFL? Um, because if that's the case, then I don't know why in today's today's college football, I don't know why you save the red shirt uh, on, on a guy, especially when he's the best opportunity. I I I think he's based on the hype, anyways, because we don't really know because we haven't seen him on the, on the college football field enough in this league. So. Uh, I I can't believe that he's a worse shot in the dark uh, than Malik, Malik Murphy has been because I don't think Malik Murphy's looked good. I also don't think they've utilized Malik Murphy the way that they should because uh, he's the type of quarterback that, hey, if he transfers anywhere, if he transferred over uh, to, you know, I, I talked about USC, but if you were to t- transfer over, we're, we're talking about them going against K-State. If he were to transfer over to K-State next year, imagine what kind of powerhouse he could be with them with the type of offense that they run. I think that would be a good fit for him, but That'd yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking I'm looking at Malik Murphy right now, and I just don't think he's the fit for the Texas Longhorns and the offense that they run. 
I, I agree with you, but like at the same time, obviously we haven't seen Arch Manning do anything, so I'm stuck in that pinhole, but I still kind of stick with a little bit of Blake's decision just because like I sincerely think you need to give him a shot at least. Like not just like a series in the offense, give him the game and just let him actually try and cook here just because like you said, going against TCU, Iowa State, and who was the last one, Josh? Uh TCU, Iowa State, and Texas Tech. And Texas Tech, okay. But, I mean, still, like, between those three games, like you said, you beat me to the punch. Those are three games that you cannot sleep on just because these teams, like, obviously going winding down towards the end of the regular season where they're going to be playing a dogfight like it's the beginning of the year. But, I mean, at the same time, like, I, I'm stuck between – I, I would just like to see Arch Man just get the opportunity and let him shine. I mean, obviously, I know it's the last beginning of – I mean, not last beginning, last end of the college football season. But still, you got to give him a shot and just let him try. Just because, obviously, looking towards next year, if he does stick around and not doesn't transfer, and I, you really – it's it's hard to just because, obviously, it's such the hype of Arch Manning and how much reputation that people have seen him – have seen him talk about, but obviously he hasn't gotten even a single snap. So yeah, and, and all if, the if hype he, is there. If you put your trust in him too, does that help his decision to not transfer next year? Because you just you just put a lot of trust in him as a freshman quarterback uh, when you you really wanted to do what's best for the team in the long haul, uh, and then you ended up making a decision that helps him and the team out. Uh, does that help his decision to stick around in Texas? I think so a little bit, just because. Yeah, like, I would. I would. I would assume so. Yeah, you would assume so, but obviously that's there's a reason why we're sitting here talking about it, and unfortunately we're not with it. But I mean, yeah. still, I think I sincerely think that it does help the situation, just because, like I said, there's so much talk and hype about him, but obviously we haven't seen him do a single snap. The only time we've seen him throw the ball is during pregame warmups, but obviously he doesn't get the opportunity to get on the field. So I feel in like the long he's, run, he's I been sincerely, in just for like kind of garbage time or something like that earlier in the season. I just can't think of yeah. what it was. But, yeah, true. But like, yeah, who yeah, knows I mean, with them? I I want to see him shine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I'm excited for him. I mean, I th- whenever you build up so much hype behind a player, it's exciting to see what he's got in the tank and what he can offer you too. So, uh, it's definitely an exciting time. And right now, uh, so he, here's a scenario that I play out for you because we're going to talk about my Sooners here next. And everyone knows they lost Bedlam. All right, so here's here's the scenario that plays out because now I'm rooting for Texas. Uh, as an Oklahoma fan, it, you you have to root for Texas because it's screw the Big Twelve now. Uh, you know, uh, you, if you don't have national championship hopes on the line, screw the Big Twelve. We're going out and we're we're making sure you can't get it. So Oklahoma wins out. Uh, enough chaos happens where they they get up and up to number two in the in the Big Twelve, make it to the Big Twelve championship game, and Texas wins out the rest of the season, gets to the Big Twelve championship game. Oklahoma, so really either way, whether Oklahoma wins or Texas wins, the Big 12 loses because it's the SEC teams are in the, in the Big 12 championship game. But best case scenario, as a, as a Sooners fan and just as screw the Big 12, uh, is Oklahoma wins, forcing Texas to not make it to the college football playoffs. Therefore, the Big 12 doesn't even make it to the college football playoffs now this year. So, I mean, I just how sweet is that if, if, you're, if you're looking at the, at the scenario to just say, you know what, Big 12, we're done with you. Uh, and, and a big part of that, too, I mean, so the three games that I watched pretty much every snap of uh, were, was the Nebraska. Uh, I guess I guess I watched every snap of the, the Washington-USC uh, game and then also the Alabama-LSU game as well because those were both going on at the same time. I had those on split screens as well. Um, but earlier on, the, on in the day, Nebraska, uh, the K-State-Texas uh, game and then the Oklahoma game, those three games – were some of the the most atrocious officiating I have ever seen uh, in, in an entire day of college football. I mean, just the, the worst. Uh, Nebraska, uh, P- Nebraska fans, I feel for you because not only did you get screwed by a lot of big time calls that kind of hurt you uh, there, especially late. Harburg uh, throws a ball uh, and it could have been caught. It was actually a pretty good throw, and the receiver gets tackled. And then the very next play, he throws an interception. That really hurts. Uh, and then there was a couple of others that were just questionable ones. But then it comes down to the last play. And it looked like, it, to me, in real time, it just seemed obvious. It was a forward pass, uh, hits the ground, incomplete pass. Stop the clock. There's, I think, 12 seconds left on the clock or something like that. Nebraska has another opportunity to launch it deep, hopefully be able to get out of bounds, kick a field goal, tie the game. That's the best-case scenario. 
probably not going to happen because it's Nebraska. Let's be honest. They're not good at those closing out those games. But yeah. then they end up calling it a fumble. And I'm sitting here yelling at the TV, why is the clock still running? They lined it up as if it was a fumble. Uh, so they moved Nebraska back. They don't reach bowl eligibility because, I mean, because they lost the game. Uh, and so we can't just blame the refs for a loss. And I'm not going to go that far. Um, but but then, you know, the, the refs just made a huge mistake there. And that nobody called it. Nobody nobody stopped it. The the commentators were even talking about how terrible that was. K-State, Texas, there was a lot of, a lot of refereeing that, and officiating that I just didn't agree with. I didn't like it. Uh, and so it was all over the place. Now we're going to get to Bedlam. Uh, where man, I, I I see this, and and I'm just tired of talking about referees. I'm ta- tired of 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 talking about how they how they do change uh, at least the momentum in games, and, and that's really frustrating. We've talked about this way too much, and, and it's not just not just for my team. I'm not saying this because it's my team that lost the game. I don't I don't care about that in in the aspect of of you know to go as far as to say that the referees are the ones that lost the game. But I mean, uh, Jeremy. I, I I know you you were just trying to catch up on a lot of it since you were busy this weekend, um, but I mean, it, there, there has to we've talked about this too much. There has to be a point where we say that the referees need to answer for the calls that they make on the field and be penalized whenever they make terrible calls like we've seen all weekend. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's one thing to make one little mental error mistake on the field, but if you consistently do it and you don't call it both ways. That just drives the absolute bonkers out of myself, and I know it does for you as well. Obviously, you and I have both watched plenty of college football together, and we'll literally bark at the TV so many times, like, what the heck are you doing? Why aren't you throwing the flag? Like, we would literally see – like, we see it a lot on PI calls just because, like, it happened a couple times when we were at the Oklahoma game, and then later during the game we saw the exact same situation on the flipped around, and it wasn't called, and then we were literally – Oh, uh, we were barking so bad. We were barking worse than Georgia barking at everybody this season. Yeah. Um, like it was, it, it's atrocious. And the big thing that really got me, especially just because, like, obviously you said, I didn't get a chance to catch. I'm still trying to catch up a little bit, but the clip that you sent me of going into the end zone, I looked at that. Yeah. My jaw hit the floor. I'm like, what? And, and it's, it's one two beep? that. And, and you you look at this game and the, just the magnitude of this game. The last bedlam is what they're calling it, you know. And it is the last mm-hmm. bedlam uh, for the foreseeable future. And so it is it is a big deal. And both teams want to win it. Hats off to Oklahoma State. You played a much better game than I would have expected out of Oklahoma State. So I, I'll, I'll give that yeah. to them. But let's let's start off with this just so we can get out of the way. Um, because, you know, the refs, I think they just need to be held accountable. And I'm going to be frustrated about the calls throughout the game because I do think that it it made a difference in the momentum at the very least, which hurts the game. Ultimately, I'll get to it. I think Oklahoma didn't play their best football, and I think Oklahoma lost the game, okay? So I'm not trying to make excuses for why Oklahoma lost. But the the referees need to be held accountable for things like a pass interference call uh, that that was called on Bowman in the end zone. Uh, for for you know Oklahoma State came down, and, and there's a pass interference called on Bowman. Uh, first off, it wasn't Bowman; it was it was Kip Lewis. Anyways, uh, that was like at the 8:03 mark in the fourth quarter. Uh, the ball was overthrown out into the stands, so there's no way that there could have possibly been pass interference. If you would have called holding, uh, I'll let it slide. It wasn't a good call, uh, but I'll let it slide because you can hold, and then it causes the the quarterback to overthrow it because he thinks, well, I can't get it to him anyways. Uh, so I can understand if it was a holding. You called pass interference, and it was way overthrown, completely uncatchable, without a doubt. Uh, and not only that, but it was also a tight end run, running over the linebacker. So just a ridiculous yeah. call there that really changed uh, some some momentum in in that drive. That that may not have changed a whole lot, but another pass interference uh, not called on Oklahoma State uh, when they tackle Stoops, the one that you were just mentioning, that they tackle Stoops, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that clip, tackling Stoops in the yeah, end zone, does. just a, the most blatant pass interference that you can possibly get. Uh, you know, so you do that, and that was when Oklahoma's down six with four, uh, four minutes and fifty three seconds left on the clock. It changes the momentum in the in the last five minutes of the game. Uh, OU has to use a timeout because of it, because Brent Venables is wondering where the time, where the flag is, and ends up sending the the field goal unit out there. So using up a timeout that you really needed later on in the game, and now you just kick a field goal, uh, and and OSU gets the ball back now. 
Uh, so I mean, just looking at this, I mean, that was that was some of the the most blatant, uh, just just bad calls that I've seen against Oklahoma. Uh, you know, and I've seen others too. And there was there was one uh, during the Washington game, I believe it was Washington USC, where the refs let the let the clock just keep on ticking down. It's a little bit on the on the timing, uh, whoever's in control of the time. But the refs didn't catch it, and they just sat there and let it keep on going. And then then they have to scramble around to try to figure out how to fix it. It's just uh, the, the refs need to get things under control. This is your job. And so we're expecting you to do your job. Uh, so I'm, I'm bringing this up for the Oklahoma game because I do think that that was some of the worst officiating I've seen in a long time. But it's not that's not why Oklahoma lost. Um, you know, I, I think this is a perfect example of looking at the stats. If you look at this Bedlam game, uh, it's a perfect example of looking at the stats and realizing that stats don't tell the whole story. Um, because Oklahoma State wins uh, in, in the turnover battle. They uh, they won 3-1 to one in, in turnover battle. Oklahoma turned the ball over three times. I'll call it four times because there was a field goal that we kicked that should not have been kicked. I think I believe it was a fourth and seven, if I remember correctly. And you just go for it there because you're not going to make a 50-some-yard field goal. Um, it, 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 we just we, we don't have a good kicker this year. So I, no. I think that was a – I count that as a turnover. Um, but then, you know, there was – Eight penalties for for fifty five yards, fifteen a yard, uh, you know, on a, a game winning drive because Brent Venables uh, walks out on the field. Another one where the refs need to be held accountable. Why did you throw a, a penalty flag there? Because we've seen refs get chewed out nonstop by by, by coaches. You look at Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, some of the best mm-hmm. in the game. Yeah. They yell at, at referees and get up in their face and and will scream at them. They don't. You, you, I I don't mind that you throw a penalty every once in a while when the when a coach is getting out of hand, but there was no reason. Brett Venables walks out to the field and is questioning a call. That was it. He was questioning a pass interference call that shouldn't have been called on Oklahoma, and and so he walks out there trying to get an answer, and he doesn't throw a fit. He doesn't wave his arms around. He looks confused and walks out and just kind of throws his his hands up in a shrug. The referee turns around, throws a flag. 15 yards, gives them momentum to go down and score a touchdown. Uh, so penalties killed Oklahoma really bad. Uh, and there was one interception uh, that which Gabriel threw. Uh, that was really more because of pressure. I'm tired of hearing the, the, the crap talked about Dylan Gabriel too because he is a good quarterback. Um, but then, you know, there was another one uh, by Barnes. Uh, where he he fumbled the snap on a direct snap and tries pitching it at Gabriel. People blame that on on Gabriel too. That's not on him. Uh, there was another one that was technically a Gabriel fumble that was a low snap and bounced off his ankles. And so just turnovers that were just you you can't turn the ball over three times and expect to win. Um, but then going off on from that, the offense they made bad play calls when they're needed on big plays. The the fourth and four. I don't know why you're running a route that's only two yards downfield, but you need to get the ball across the, the first down marker when that's the last drive of the game and you need it. Uh, and then Oklahoma State had 14 drives because I'm hearing a lot of crap talked about this defense, but I'm blaming the offense 100 percent because the 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 uh, Oklahoma State they had 14 drives and only allowed 27 points. That's like 1.9 points per drive. You can't expect a defense to be much better than that. Not only that, but there was the fumble from Barnes that gave him the, it gave Oklahoma State a first down on the Oklahoma State 43-yard line, a missed field goal uh, at, at the Oklahoma State 33-yard line, uh, an interception on a first down uh, that gave them the o- Oklahoma State at the 36, and then a fumble uh, that, that which was down at, at G- Gabriel's ankles that gives them the ball on the Oklahoma 19-yard line. They get the ball in the red zone, and the defense holds them out to just a field goal on that one. Uh, so just not only that, but also Oklahoma State, they, they ran the time of possession by almost 15 minutes more than Oklahoma. So just a, a terrible game by Oklahoma's offense. I will blame it on the offense. Uh, I don't know if you blame this directly on Levy or if it just wasn't execution. I do think there were several times where there was opportunities where players just didn't didn't connect properly. Uh, and so overall, and, and I'm also tired of hearing, I love Tawi Walker. He is the best back in our backfield. But I'm tired of hearing people talk crap about how he should have been in the game when Sawchuck at one point was running and, and averaging 10.8 yards per carry. So, I mean, he had a phenomenal game. It's not like he couldn't get the ball going. So I think you stick with him in that game, especially when Tawi Walker was just kind of banged up. Um, but, <laughs> Jeremy, off my rant, uh, I'm ticked off. Oklahoma lost the Bedlam game, uh, and and it sucks to see him lose that way. Absolutely. But first, before I go off, do you feel a little bit better about yourself, Josh? Uh, now that I got some of it out, out in public, sure. 
Okay, that's, as long <laughs> as you feel better, that's all that matters. No, no it's, but it's, I, it's, I it's agree. It's just one of those weekends, you know. It's it's you see them lose two games in a row, based off of just really, really poor execution on a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it's like I said, it's one thing to have a bad game, but it's another thing to have a bad game due to the refereeing and officiating. That just makes it so much more. It's just even hard to watch for some aspects of the game, just because. I mean. It, it's harder to accept it, just made the- it, I think, as a fan. And, and every fan has been there. So so don't come at Oklahoma fans for being upset at them. Uh, or LSU fans are in the same boat because there was one that they thought should have been a horse collar that wasn't called all that crap. You yeah. know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, every fan has been there where it feels like the referees really stole the game from you. And it's just harder to mm-hmm. accept it. And so I'm, I'm not going to yell at Oklahoma fans for being ticked off about that because you have every right to. I think college football fans should be upset when referees make make uh, decisions that, that hurt Ball the game. mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, if, if there's another head coach that I was going to mention, but you were also kind of ranting a little bit, I was I was letting you go. But if there's another head coach that, that deserves a, a lot of flags for his – his actions as the head coach at Iowa State, Matt Campbell. I, yeah. I tell you what, I've seen a lot of head coaches pissed off. Then I've seen Matt Campbell pissed off. He is scary when he's pissed off. But well, I mean, no, uh, seriously, uh, Lance Leipold is another one. Uh, you know, he, yeah, he gets he gets fired. He's a. It's so funny looking at how how calm and nice he is in press conferences and interviews, and then he's out there on the against the referees, and man, he just he looks like his head's about to pop off. Oh, dude, I literally, I literally see him upset. I literally think of a tomato face just because his face <laughs> is that red, upset, pissed Bob off. The and then, like you said, yeah, literally, you said it the best. And then he goes to a press conference, cool as a cucumber. Yeah. And all of a sudden, back Turned on the field, Larry, real quick. pissed off red tomato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But no, literally, Larry Lightpool. it's just been – it's just <laughs> – there you go, Larry Lightpool. But literally, like, it, it, it's just so hard at times just because of fishing. But we've talked about this so much. And I, I 100% agree with you, Josh. But if you're going to have a, a bad officiating crew, like – and obviously I know, like, you can only pick so much between officiating crews. But at the same time, if you're going to call a bad situation – and you seriously, sincerely need to speak up and whether it's speaking up, refing less games or even in docked pay, just because like we've talked about this countless times, if you're going to be like that, something sincerely has to happen and there has to be action taken upon just because if you're going to get stuff like that, it's going to draw away viewers. And obviously like it, that doesn't make it any better for the program itself and losing less viewers, obviously less money in their pocket. So I'm done on my little rant, nowhere near compared to yours, but that's where I stand. No. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's it, oh, oh, the reason why I brought it up in, in several games is because just overall, it just felt like one of the worst weekends for officiating that I've seen in a long time. Uh, and, and it happens in the NFL a lot too. So I say college football fans, but I, I think football fans in general, I think football might be the worst officiating uh, outside of maybe basketball, but basketball just gotten so weak. So I don't really blame the officiating yeah. as much, but I think football might be some of the worst officiating that we've seen. Um, it just, I don't know, just overall, it's just frustrating for any fan base to have to go through that. But Oklahoma state wins the last bedlam in the foreseeable future, 27 to 24. Uh, again, hats off to bedlam uh, to, to Oklahoma state. Um, and one thing too, can we stop storming the field and tearing down field goal posts for oh my gosh, just, just dude, a win? That- that, that just shows how little you think of yourself. I'm okay with it from Kansas. Kansas, go have a day because, what was it, 1994 since they, they won yeah. against Oklahoma and then even longer than that, like 80-something since they won a top-10 opponent. Have a day. But Oklahoma State, that's how that's how little you think of yourself, that you beat Oklahoma in, in kind of a downslope right now too. It just seems like they're in a downward spiral and you're going to be a, a, all proud about that. Um, but anyways, man, uh, let's go on to the next one. Um, because I'm I'm ready to stop talking about Oklahoma, and that's Missouri at Georgia, uh, Mizzou. Man, we talked about this, and you know what? I, I want to give a hats off to this show because uh, you know I, I was I was looking. I know you sent over your picks. I didn't really have time to look through them because I was uh, a lone man and, and trying to juggle everything all at once. Anyways, on Saturday, but I was looking through your picks. You had a lot of really good picks. I think you made a lot of really good predictions, uh, and then I I came out on air. I think that was our our best weekend for predictions. And then on top of that, there was a few little contests and and uh, tweets that I, I I kind of went went out and and commented on, and I was really close on a lot of games and and might have been the best predicting game or a weekend uh, uh, that we might have ever had uh, as a show. So 
uh, just hats off to us because this was, this was one of them. I picked Mizzou. I, I, I was looking at Mizzou, and I think Mizzou has what it takes to cover that 15-point spread or whatever it was. And and I, I saw this, and I, you know a lot of people were, were kind of dogging that pick. And I, I liked Missouri going into this game and, and what they were able to bring to the table and using Luther Burden, man. That's, that's what you've got to do. And he, he had a big-time touchdown that really got them out ahead uh, there early in the game, and they kept themselves in the game. Uh, and, and, yeah, this, this was number one in, in the uh, East against number two in the East. And Missouri Missouri proved that they deserved to be in that position and, and to be uh, in that talk. And so hats off to Mizzou, man. You, you guys put up a fight, and you were outdogged, uh, pun intended. But just looking at this, I mean, Brady, Brady Cook and Luther Burden, they had a few great connections that really helped out. Uh, and then they also used Theo Weiss Jr., uh, former Sooner, so shout out to him. Uh, you know, and, and they were able to utilize him. I think he was the leading receiver uh, in in that game. In that game, and they really needed him to step up uh, against against these Bulldogs. And then Cody Schrader too. I brought him up. How much you're going to need to rely on him? And he had a great game, 112 yards and a touchdown. But looking over at Georgia, talking about the winners now, Georgia, you went out there and you battled to the end against a team that wasn't going to give up, and and you put up a, a really good fight and you outdogged them. Uh, and that's just how it is. And, and that's that's what you got to do as a championship team. We've seen this from Georgia in the past. They're they're on their way trying to make their, their three-peat. Carson Beck and the Georgia offense, they show that they could do just fine, uh, even without Brock Bowers in the game, as, as we've mentioned before. McConkie comes in, and he leads the receiving with seven receptions and 95 yards. Uh, and, and Carson Beck, he was nearly flawless, ended up going 254 yards and two passing touchdowns. Just a, a great game by the Georgia Bulldogs, battling it out towards the end because uh, it was a dog fight, and I'm going to keep on using all these dog puns that I can as much as I can uh, but while we're talking about Georgia. But they, they were. They were in this dog fight down to the end, and they were able to pull out and show that they're a championship team that knows how to win different ways. And, and Georgia just came out. They were just They were better. Uh, and, and just about every every facet of the game uh, when it came down to it and what they really needed. They end up winning 30 to 21, but again, only nine points. All right, so Missouri, keep your head high because we keep on talking about this Missouri Tiger team and they've got a lot to be able to build on. Uh, they're, they're looking better and better and I'm, I'm really happy for them. Absolutely, but I mean, I'm going to flat out say this, losing to Georgia 30 to 21, that's a win in my book against... Oh, yeah the possible three P team that I shouldn't say possible. We're more likely probably going to see it, but anything's possible here, but seriously, watch like, them you Buckeyes, look at, yeah, I know. I mean, you got to watch out for them or them, or them I mean, sign stealing uh, Wolverines. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. I, hey, they got to play somebody good first. Calm down there. Um, <laughs> but I mean, looking at this overall aspect, just going against Georgia and Missouri, that was one game we love to talk about. Like you said, number one against number two. I was really looking forward to it, but obviously I had to work, but I'm still catching up on highlights. So guys, bear with me just because I know I didn't get a chance to watch a whole bunch of it. But still, having that kind of a stature going into the game, it's definitely a big confidence booster for this organization just because, like, take it for granted, now they're 7-2, and two, but still, this Missouri team, they're definitely no team to slouch on. Like, I've said that before, guys, and, like, you look at this aspect, like, for what they were able to bring, and uh, I know the score, at, like, going into the fourth quarter was obviously 24-11, um, to uh, 11, but, I mean, still, like, for what able for what able to Missouri to bring it back, that was a really good showing for that team and organization just because at any kind of an aspect, if it was any other team, you look at that kind of aspect and think, there's no way we're going to catch these guys. They're too powerful. But, no, this Missouri team, they didn't give up. They stuck in with a fight, and they actually – gave every single ounce of energy and opportunity that they can get and try and find the open field and just march down the field. But obviously Georgia's defense is one of the top defenses that we've always talked about. And just trying to get, uh, just trying to get uh, emphasis going against that kind of a defense is so difficult, but still my hats is off to Missouri for putting up a heck of a fight against the dog pound and literally like I said earlier, guys, these dogs, they're definitely been barking, not more than me and Josh bark at the TV, but sincerely, like, they they just keep monching and monching on their opponents like they do every single week. And I don't necessarily know if there's going to be any team unless it's Ohio State beating them, but at the same time, we're going to have to wait until we find out later in the season. Yeah, I mean, that, that Ohio State-Michigan game is coming down, just like it was last year, down to one of the most exciting matchups uh, closing out the year. 
So, I mean, it's it's going to be fun to, to close out the rest. It's just sad to see that we have only got, what, three more weeks left, something like that. So I just – Don't say that because it's, it's going to make me sad. Yeah, it's, it sucks to, to think that three more weeks until the regular season's over. But then we get to, to conference championship games, uh, get into the, the bowl games. Bowl season is always fun because you get – uh, stints where you, you you got a game all week, uh, you know, every, every day of the week. Every single uh, so, I mean, it's, yep. it's, it's a lot of fun. We still got the NFL to hang on to for a little while longer too, but man, it, it is, it's really sad. But Jeremy, when you're thinking of Christmas gifts, when you're thinking of, of what to get somebody, what better gift could you give somebody than a big frig cooler? Dude, that w- if I got a big frig cooler for Christmas, I would literally be screaming like a little kid on Christmas. But guys, if you're if you're gonna be doing some holiday shopping, I know people have already seen on TV Black Friday deals have been going out. But if there's one kind of thing that if you want for a good holiday gift, I sincerely am going to be looking on the Big Freak website because I'm going to take advantage of that. But outside of that, Big Freak is an unbelievable company and just their overall aspect of lines and everything that they have between their coolers, their tumblers, and every single thing that they have for merchandise it is truly unbelievable. I'll start off with their coolers like Josh was getting to. Their coolers are top of the line i absolutely love them they're built they're not the they're not flimsy they're not they're nothing short upon to brag about but i shouldn't say brag about nothing short upon to dis brag about just because big freak is definitely one of my favorites just because you look at their coolers they're heavily insulated they're drain plugs just even looking at the little details they're drain plugs a drain plug you would think okay like this is just going to be a simple little pop tab off of a drain plug. No, you look at a big freak cooler. It's an actual corkscrew drain plug to where you actually physically have to unscrew it. And it's heavy duty and built in there. I've, I've put my cooler through a lot of use and that cooler absolutely is unbelievable. And even looking at something simple like their designs, the Badlands cooler is what I have. Josh has the same one as I do, but that design is absolutely unbelievable. I'm a hunter. And when I see camouflage, I get really excited just because I love hunting. And once I saw the cooler that I got, I was absolutely tickled pink just because it was the same kind of, it was the same kind of aspect for what I wanted in a cooler. But even going also into the detail, they have on the inside there, they have a cutting board and a basket that plays into a lot of positives for like when we're on the road we can have something to cut our sandwiches with or even like the basket for storing our meat and cheese in that really helps a lot we use it a lot on our tailgating tour and that was really a big big plus for us on our tailgating tour but even outside of the course looking at other tumblers they're really really strong they're really really good you can get your custom designs on the cooler if you shoot big friggin message and I sincerely kid you not, guys, I had my coffee in my tumble this morning, and then I went out, I did some errands this morning, and I completely forgot about it. I was really disappointed. I did that at 7.30 this morning, and I got back at 11.30. My coffee was still hot like it just came out of the cup. So, guys, we love Big Freak so much, and we want you guys to love Big Freak so much. So if you look at the link down below, and uh, not the link, but the description, excuse me, go to bigfreak.com and use our code RISING220. That is R I S I N G T O two zero. You will get twenty percent off of your order. But sincerely, guys, I say this every time, and I sincerely mean it. And Josh absolutely loves hearing me say it because I know it gets a big smile on his face. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> so tell Brock that we sent you guys over to Big Frig, and like I said, use the code Rising two twenty. That is R I S I N G T O two zero, and you will get twenty percent off of your purchase. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, like I said, it's it's already getting into the uh, good season, the, the fun season of Christmas season. Uh, we, we actually just, we, we hung the lights. I told my wife we're not allowed to turn them on until after Thanksgiving. It was a nice warm day yesterday, so we had to hang the lights on the house, get it all prepped up and get it ready to go. Uh, so that way I don't have to go crawling around in the ice and the snow to try to hang <laughs> the lights up. But, uh, you know, it's, it's getting to that time of the season. So something, something small like a, like the tumbler. And like Jeremy said, if you look around Black Friday deals too, I don't know what, what Big Frig does for Black Friday deals. Maybe they have an even better deal on top of that. Uh, and then you use our 20% off. Man, you, you could just have such an amazing deal on a great product. So guys, go check them out. Um, we, we really do love them. But Jeremy, we had Florida State at Pitt. All right, this is, a, this is a Florida State team who came in on the rankings. They were ranked number four. Uh, not a lot of people really have, uh, you know, a, a whole lot of a grasp on how good this Florida State team is. I think the Seminoles look extremely well, and I think they showed that uh, against Pitt. 
Uh, they, they started off slow, and everyone said, oh, look how, how they're starting off slow. A lot like what they did with the Buckeyes. But they were able to finish the game out. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say on this game because I didn't catch the entire game, but I was able to catch back up on it later on. And just seeing how they played, I didn't see a lot of big mistakes. I saw a defense that stayed out there and, and did a, a really good job of, of controlling the game overall. Uh, and I saw an offense that, that did, their, did their part and, and came out there and, and helped win this game. Uh, Florida State, they held Pitt to only seven points in this game, and this is a Pitt team that isn't a good team this year. And so you would expect them to roll right over top of them. But winning 24-7, to seven, uh, I think that, that like I said, they, they got off to a slow start, only up 10-7 to seven at halftime. But they put up 14 uh, more points to win 24-7 t- uh, uh, to seven there. Uh, and, you know, in this, this second half, they were able, you know, they were only half a point away from covering the spread, too. Uh, that, that was one of them I, I thought I might take, and I didn't end up taking that one. I'm glad I didn't because they didn't end up covering that. They were half a point away. Um, but, you know, Jordan Travis, he has a Heisman-worthy game. Uh, he, he had 360 yards and two touchdowns, and the receivers just played their role. Uh, they really, the, the entire offense played their role, I think, in that second half to really come out and, and win this game. So, like I said, personally, I'm, I'm okay with teams like, like how we've seen from Georgia even and, and Alabama and Ohio State. I'm okay with them and it's taking off to a slow start, getting their feet wet and get, getting rolling as long as you don't let the game get out of, out of hand. And and come out and close the game out. I think I don't I don't have anything wrong with that. I liked the way FSU looked. I think they won a really good game, twenty four to seven against Pitt. I'm not going to knock you in the standings one bit for that. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you you necessarily look at this Florida State game. Like I'm I'm in the same boat. I didn't get a chance to see a whole bunch of it. But you look at the overall aspect of this, and you can't be disappointed with how the overall aspect of the game was performing. Just because you look at this and you look at this game, I know it's only a twenty-four to seven game, but still, like you said, this was something that a lot of people were sincerely thinking. Okay, this is just going to be right out of the gate from the get-go. Just people are going to be running, monstered right over them. But no, Louis Pitt, this team, they're definitely not one team to mess around with. Sincerely, just because you look at the overall aspect of what Pitt was able to bring, obviously for Stats like Christian Venue, I, I only he only threw 15 for 36, and that's not the greatest of the game. But still, having 244 yards against a really, really good Florida State team, that's something I'm not going to hang my head against. I know talking about Florida State, we've talked about a lot about Florida State. But sincerely, you can look at another team like Pitt. They're definitely something that you sincerely can't sleep upon on. I know their record's only – not the greatest. They wish you could flip it around, be seven and two, but really it's only two and seven. But at the same time, like you can't really, really be disappointed with this guys. And just looking at the overall game, this was something I didn't really get a chance to really watch or listen to. But for the overall aspect of from what I've seen for stat wise, this is definitely something that they're going to look at this kind of a game and I'm thinking, okay, we can actually hang in with these guys. But unfortunately, obviously, like I said, the scoreboard plays a big difference in the role. So looking at this aspect, obviously they're going to go back and watch film and overall they're definitely going to be, um, they're definitely going to be studying to where they, um, they know they, they can make some minor adjustments or they can just simply just completely scratch out the scratch out the entire thing and then they can try and make something better out of this overall aspect of the game. But my I'm still giving my hats off to Pitt for hanging in with the with a really, really good Florida State team. But obviously like we've talked about when you look at this college football poll and you look at the overall aspect of these top six teams, it's sincerely so hard to try and just knock off one of these teams just because of how dominant they played and going week in and week out and how they're performing. So literally, I'm going to be throwing a lot of credit to Pitt here just because of what they're being able to do here. So my hats is off to them. So I, I sincerely think that they can end the season on a strong point. I know the record says different, but still, I sincerely think of these guys as they can do, they can hang in and get maybe squeeze one or two more wins and out the rest of the year. Yeah, yeah, and a d- disappointing season for Pitt, but uh, overall, like, like when you look over at the Seminoles, uh, and, and like I said, I don't have anything wrong with the team just closing out the game because what we've talked about this before. What better way to win a game than to walk out and look at look back at the game and look back at the film, like you said, uh, and and watch that film, feeling like you lost the game, but you have a win on the record. That that's the best way to look at a game. So I I, I like this for the Seminoles. I think they're looking stronger and stronger each week. Um, but for this next game, Jeremy, we're going to have to turn these around a little bit because, you know, if you're riding on a motorcycle and you're going fast, you got the bill for it, it might fly right off. 
And that's exactly what was happening to these Oregon Ducks. They were flying all over the field. If they were wearing their hat forward like I was, I just now was, uh, that hat would have flown off a long time ago because these Oregon Ducks, man, like they scored a lot of points. Started off, uh, you know, kind of a little slower start, I guess, for the defense. Uh, you know, or they, they started off, it was 14-10 to 10 at the end of the first quarter. Uh, and then they just put on a scoring clinic. They end up winning the game 63 to 19. 63 to 19. Just an a, amazing uh, outcome for this this Ducks team. Uh, just seeing what they they were able to do. Uh, Bo Nix makes his case for the Heisman again. 386 yards, four touchdowns, uh, and and then two rushing touchdowns. So six total touchdowns on the day for Bo Heisman, uh, as some people around here would like to call him. Uh, and then Tez Johnson, man, he was his favorite target with 12 receptions, 180 yards, and he got two of those touchdowns for Bo Nix. So just an am- amazing uh, showing for, you know, the offense to be able to turn it around. I'm going to turn this hat back around because I feel silly wearing it backwards. I just can't pull it off the way Blake can. Um, but <laughs> being able to to turn this game around, starting off to a slow start, your, your defense let up more points in the first quarter than they did the entire rest of the game. So you're, you're totally happy with the way your defense played. Come out there and, and just smack around these these Bruins. Uh, or, I'm sorry, what, what is what are the Cal? Are they, are they the Bruins? Golden Golden Bruins? The, yeah, I think they're the Golden Bruins. Something like, no, that's that's I UCLA, say, right? No, I, I don't know why I'm drawing yeah, a blank. Yeah. They're, they're a bear, I think, uh, if, if I remember right. I don't know why. Yeah, Cal I'm, Berkeley. I'm going to have to. I'm, <laughs> Look it up for me because it's going to drive me nuts. Yeah, yeah, now that I'm, yeah. I'm I'm thinking of this, but I mean, just the fact that your your offense, uh, I don't think your offense started off slow at all. I think the defense just had a, a you know kind of a slow start getting adjusted, uh, and, and not only that, but when your offense is that good, it's hard for your defense to to be good. So uh, you know, I, I think this defense did a really good job of of turning things around, letting up ten points in the first quarter, nine points the rest of the game, uh, winning the game, and like I said, with this offense scoring 63, 63 to nineteen, just whooping up on them and uh, making a really good case. I think next weekend's going to be a lot of fun for uh, for Blake up there in Eugene. Dude, Blake's going to have the absolute time of his life up in Eugene. I know he's getting to he's getting to knock that off of his bucket list before I do, but that's obvious. I'm just, I'm just saying that just because I'm sincerely jealous just because Oregon is definitely a place that I've always wanted to go to. I have family that lives out there, but hopefully I get the opportunity that I do get to go out to Oregon. And if I do, I am definitely going to be going to Eugene to watch Oregon ball out. But I mean, sincerely, you look at this Oregon squad, we talk so much about Oregon and just being, what able there to produce and just having a team put up 63 points. That is, is absolutely unbelievable. And the sad thing is they're not they're not anything used to not seeing high scoring games. You look at back of their this entire season, they've definitely racked up the points. I don't know what their average per game throughout this entire season has been, but it's definitely have to it has to be definitely over 28 to 35 points per game. Just because you look at like I said for Oregon, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and pull up their um I'm gonna try and pull up their scores from their previous games for you guys but i mean looking at this aspect they've just definitely been able to ball up here and that's not saying that for basketball wise just but oregon has definitely been lights in likes out then i know blake loves saying it it's not bo nix at the end of the year i wouldn't be surprised if it's bo heisman here just bo heisman has definitely been smelling i think if you can if you can go in and and win the pac-12 and it comes down to Michael Penix and, and Bo Nix. I think they both make it to New York at this point. I don't see how you, you don't send both of them to New York. Um, but mm-hmm. I th- I think, I sincerely think that this team could, uh, I, I think they could have Bo Nix win the Heisman if they win the Pac-12. Uh, and, and it's going to be mm-hmm. tough, but I think Dan Lanning learned from his mistakes. And I don't know, right now, if I had to take a pick right now, I think Oregon wins a second matchup. But after seeing how Washington performed, I don't know. It's it's tough, but then I think you know, Oregon Oregon keeps on showing up too. But to to answer your your question, uh, they they had forty seven point four yards per per uh, game. And did you did you look up what the what the mascot is for the for uh, Cal Berkeley? No, I I tried to do it, but I was having a little bit of an issue. But I can't hear. Here, Cal Cal Berkeley, Cal Berkeley mascot. Here, I got it pulled up. Oski, then Oski the bear. Yeah, Oski the bear. I was trying to think. I'm like, I wanted to say it was a bear, but I don't they know. They are why the golden bears. Yeah, so 
Yeah, they're the Golden Bears. All right. Yeah. So I, I don't we know because right. uh, it's not the Golden Bruins. That's that's what the UCLA is. Golden Bruins. Yeah. And then you got the Golden yeah. Bears. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, just just looking at forty seven point four points per game. Uh, that's that's outstanding. And then your defense being good enough, like we said, this is the kind of team that you got to build. The same with Washington. They were they they had a tough one. Let's go ahead and jump over to that game because Washington is is really built very similar to Oregon. That's why I love that matchup, and I can't wait. I really hope that it comes down to that for the Pac-12 uh, championship game. Because looking no at kidding. this, these two teams, you got Washington uh, who is going against USC, who is also no joke uh, when it comes to to offense. And and nobody nobody rags on USC for scoring so many points. That that's what they have to do to win games. They 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 mm-hmm. rag on them for their defense. Hats off to Lincoln Riley and and the Trojans. You know whoever it was that was in charge. Uh, I would assume Lincoln Riley was probably the head man to say, "Hey, we got to get rid of Grinch." Good job, you finally got rid of him. But you're still an idiot for keeping him around this long and dragging him out to to LA with you in the first place. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Maybe their yeah. defense all of a sudden just starts starts going off. Um, because I think they have playmakers. That's the thing. It's just the play calls that that they're making on defense doesn't make any sense. Um, but you know, going over to Washington and uh, in, in this matchup against USC, Michael Penix Jr. To me, uh, he is the Heisman front runner. I don't see how you can put another guy ahead of him. Uh, he was seventy three percent on the day, two hundred fifty six yards and two touchdowns. He had a really good game, and and especially the touchdown uh, to to his big guy Culp uh, there towards the end of the first half to to give them the lead before half. Uh, that, that was a, a huge play. He scrambled around the backfield, all kinds of pressure, and was able to find a guy. And and, and I loved the setup, too, because you had uh, Roma Dunze sitting right there in, in the front of the end zone, and the, the safety came up to try to cover that because his eyes are down that way. But he was looking... At his, at his big guy, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Culp is a tight end. He's either a tight end or just a really big receiver. Um, but he came he came across the back in the end zone. And a beautiful throw, beautiful timing, but then an amazing catch for him to make the catch into the end zone for to, to take the lead at halftime. At that point, it just felt like Washington was going to win the game. The way that they got the turnover, got Caleb Williams to fumble the ball. Uh, you know, and then looking at Dylan Johnson, man, you and I were talking about this during the game. We, we, we had the group chat going uh, with you, me, and Blake. And, man, Dylan Johnson has a hat trick in the first half, ends the game with 256 yards, 9.8 yards per carry. That is unheard Oof. of in a game. Uh, and then four touchdowns. So just being able to utilize that run game the way that they did, and they were really more balanced on the on the runs the run game uh, than they were over on passing. They they ran the ball more than they they passed it in terms of yardage. Uh, and then the time of possession and third down efficiency. This is what won the game because they had almost ten minutes more of time uh, time of possession than USC. So they just kept the ball. This is something that Lincoln Riley talked about at halftime going into the locker room. Hey, we need to we need to control time of possession. Both teams are trying to do it. We need to win that, and they couldn't. They couldn't. Washington did really good on defense, forcing them out. And, and I'm not going to rag on you for allowing 42 points against USC because that's just hard to stop. They've got a bunch of guys all over, uh, you know, especially with Caleb, Caleb Williams in the backfield. Um, but then Washington able to, to make uh, Williams feel uncomfortable all game long. Uh, and then, like I said a minute ago, too, with that fumble towards the, the end of the first half, giving them uh, that 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 key moment to, that, that pushes them ahead and kind of wins the momentum game. Uh, and then the, just the, the balance uh, that they had, again, looking at how they were able to consistently run the ball. Um, but then a, another thing, too, I don't know how many people caught this, but if, if you turned up your volume a little bit at halftime, I love listening to the Huskies. They both went into the same tunnel there in, in the Coliseum, and the Huskies were up behind the Trojans coming in, and you just hear them barking, barking, barking. You know, and I just I love that. You just let them know we're right here. We're in this game. We're, we're winning. We're feeling good. But Washington Huskies, man, they they – they didn't shock me, um, but they made me. They, they surprised me because they haven't been looking this good in, in a few weeks. Uh, you back up to the Arizona State game, uh, and ever since then, they haven't really shown that just overpowering, uh, you know, dominance. And so it was really good to see them win a game like this. Yeah, absolutely. And then you beat me to it. I was going to reference that ever since the Arizona State game, it just hasn't. It just hasn't looked right. But obviously, Washington is still just finding ways to get points on the board and finding a way to win. But going into this game, we all obviously know this is going to be a, a really, really good battle between two gunslingers of a quarterback between Caleb Williams and obviously Michael Pennings Jr. But looking at the overall aspect of this game, Washington was just outpowering on like no tomorrow, obviously both on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. Just literally, I 
I got home late and I caught the tail end of the game, so I didn't get a chance to see the see the beginning half of the game. But just from what I got the opportunity to see, Washington's defense was just putting Caleb Williams to his misery, and they were just finding a way to get into the backfield and get the get the big plays and get the big sacks. Then they were just all around just letting them know that we mean business and we ain't here to well, and we ain't the, here to have slouch. The thing with that too is that though they weren't completely successful every time, they didn't get him down in the backfield, but there were times where he was only able to rush for four to six yards. And, and mm-hmm. this is a guy that's that's capable of more than that. And it was constant pressure back there. And so you didn't really win that, but you were able to slow them down. I think that turnover was really the 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 thing that won the game for them, that fumble towards the end mm-hmm. of the half. Um, because without that, I don't think you you bounce ahead the way that you did. Uh, and then, of course, the offense just being able to put up 52 points. You're going against a, a junior high defense, sure, but uh, you know you you were able to win the game. Uh, and and yeah, so I mean, being able to put pressure on on Caleb, even if it didn't result in a sack or a, a loss of yards, that's what I look at, and I think that was a win for them. Absolutely, you you look at that overall aspect. That's that's a definite win in my book as well. But I mean, I know I said this at the top of the show for. Having two good quarterbacks, and I shouldn't say two quarter, two good quarterbacks. I'll say one good quarterback and one of a of a crybaby at the end of the day, just because everyone's just been giving Caleb Williams such a hard time. And I mean, still overall aspect, he can be a good quarterback. He's got talent. Obviously, we've seen him in the Heisman, but this year it's just been an absolute difference of. Caleb Williams that we've seen obviously looking at the beginning of the year he started out hot like we obviously expected but then you get one loss on the board and then right from there like I've said in previous episodes before once you get down in that slump it ain't easy to get back out of that slump and I tell you what to me it just seems like Caleb Williams just hasn't gotten out of that slump yet but I mean overall like we said you told me before we went on the air him him really really being emotional at the game then just going over to his mother after the game and being emotional but and, i mean that I that just goes to show you how much talent that oh yeah absolutely yeah. it's horrible to see but that just goes to show you how much he has love for the game how much blood yeah, sweat yeah. and tears that this kind of guy puts to the field every single night yeah and and, and I, I think that's true uh and and you know a lot of people making fun of him for it and i i hate that that you make fun of a, a kid for you know he's got a lot of talent and i know that he's he's up there sobbing and anytime he cries after a loss that's how much he takes each game uh into it into mm-hmm. heart but it's just Man, you lost a, a regular season game. I guess this one I can I can give him a little more. You know, whenever he lost to Utah, it was like, man, why are you crying over this? Uh, you know, just you know, you got to pull it together. Uh, and then you know, of course, the the second loss uh, hurts. But then you know, now you now you just got knocked out of Pac-12. Uh, you know, you're not in the driver's seat for the Pac-12 championship game anymore. You need a lot of chaos to happen. So, and it's probably not going to happen in your favor. So you know, I, I can I can get it, and I I, I do I, I appreciate you saying it that way too because I think it, it does show how much heart, how much determination and, and love for this game he does have, uh, and so I, I don't want to sit here and make fun of him for it. Uh, you know, no. as as much as much fun as that is as a college football fan, these are these are human beings, man, and they're they they put their heart and soul into this. But uh, with Caleb Absolutely. Williams, with with them probably not making Pac-12 championship anymore, most likely, uh, and absolutely out of the, out of the race for. Uh, college football playoff contentions. Do you think Caleb Caleb Williams tries to stick around another year before going to go into the NFL to see if he can win something? I I think so, just because I think Caleb Williams wants to go out on a high note. Like, not saying this isn't a high note here for him and his career, just because obviously we've seen what Caleb Williams has produced. But I sincerely think he wants to he wants to get one more year in and find that next gear. And then from there, just try and motor on through the season. Then he can get to the N- the NFL. I almost said the NHL, but he can go to the NFL and ball up. And hopefully, wherever he lands, they're going to be getting a good quarterback. I know, obviously, like we've seen, obviously so far, there's sort of CJ Stroud. He's been he's been starting to ball up here in the NFL. Then, but I mean, looking at this overall aspect, once Caleb Williams gets into the NFL, I sincerely think if I, I do think he's going to have another year, and I think that will help him become a better quarterback even then. He's already a good quarterback, like well, I said. And don't he's, get me he's wrong. He's making but... money already, so I don't think he has to rush into anything. Uh, up your stock a little bit more. I, don't, I mean, you're not going to up your stock any more than you are. That's the only reason why I say just go to the NFL because you're, you're not, you're not yeah. dropping because you lost a game because you're still putting up great numbers, and you're you're putting up 42 points with your offense. So I don't think any any scout would look at it and be like, oh, but they lost, even if you end up losing four four games, you know, like they lost four games. Ugh. 
you know, like USC is bad, and so Caleb Williams, we don't want him anymore. No, everyone looks mm-hmm. at Caleb Williams and sees that he's still having good games, even when they lose. So, uh, and and I do think they look at stuff like that with him him getting emotional. He wants to win that bad, uh, and, and you want a guy like that for sure. Um, but let's jump over to the other nighttime game that was a lot of fun to watch, and that was LSU Alabama. This was one that I was really excited for because you got the battle of the of the West. Who's going to come out on top here? And it's really Alabama in the driver's seat now because Alabama comes out. And I said this on, on Saturday morning on the show that, that Alabama, I, I said it specifically. I said Alabama is going to have to score 42 points to win this game. They ended up scoring 42 points. Uh, they didn't need to score 42 points. Turns out I was wrong on that. They didn't necessarily have to score 42, <laughs> but they did it anyways. Uh, and, and it was just looking at this defense. I think the offense played a huge part in this victory, scoring scoring their 42 points. That was an amazing an, an amazing outcome for their offense. Jalen Milrow looked amazing. He really put this team on his back. Uh, you know, Finally, it seemed like a game plan that fit his play style. And it felt like they really gave him the reins. Uh, he had 290, uh, two, sorry, 219 passing yards. He had 155 rushing yards and four touchdowns on the ground. So I mean, just the dude was just all over the place. Uh, LSU didn't know what hit them, and and Jalen Milrow had the best game of his career in this game against LSU. Uh, and and you know, looking at it, I think Jaden Daniels, uh, you know, on on the other side, I think he was kind of the, the guy. He was really lighting up the tide in the first half. Um, you know, but the adjustments were able to kind of shut him down in the second half. And even though this this offense was such a huge part in the victory, I think the second half adjustments for the defense is really what won this for Alabama because Alabama played the best defense that I think I've seen them play all season long in that second half. And again, you see see the tide. They they've done this. They did. I think the worst that they played, uh, you know, and getting too far behind and being on a slow start was to Tennessee. We saw them down. What was it? Seventeen points, something like that. Uh, and, and yeah. then they end up coming back to win it. If, if you can do that and, and not let the game get out of control, I think 17 points is out of control. Don't get yourself into that situation. But if you can come into the into halftime, what was it, 24 to 20, 24, 24, 24, something like that? 20, yeah. I, I can look it up uh, just to double check myself. But, you know, if you can if you can keep yourself in the game and still end up coming out and, and you know, having that, that explosive second half, uh, so it was, let's see, it looks like 21-21. That's halftime. what it was. Yeah, 21-21 uh, at halftime. So it, it, that you didn't let the game get out of control. And then your defense steps up big, only allows seven more points the entire entire game. You shut them out in the fourth quarter, uh, and, and you just did your job on offense. Keep on scoring. Keep your, your defense off the field as much as possible. Um, because you know, just overall, I think that, that this this tied team played really well. And again, I'm going to talk about the the time of possession because that's what wins it uh, in games like this. And especially whenever you've got an offense like LSU who can sit there and put up 45 points easy on you. Uh, I think they were averaging 70, 47 points per game, 47, uh, something like that. And so uh, you know, the tide sitting there and controlling for over half the game. Uh, and so they were able to control that and, and and keep it in their possession. So really happy for Alabama. And I I enjoy watching Alabama this year, and I really enjoy how they're winning because you see them as an underdog. Uh, you know, not really an underdog, but you see them just kind of as a uh, – no one expects them to do anything this year. No one really expected after the Texas loss, and then they struggled against USF. Everyone was like, yep, the tide's out of it. But now they're they're just as much in every contention talk as any other team in the nation right now, and I really like to see them coming from behind like this. Uh, and it's exciting and, and fun to see that. And it feels like this Alabama team is having more fun than, that, than I've seen in the past, too. It just always seemed like they were very strict and controlled. Uh, and, and even Nick Saban himself, smiling a lot more and having a good time. I think that's I think that's a really fun thing to see for this Alabama team. Yeah, I don't know if they necessarily gave um, they gave Nick Saban a special kind of brownie before they they got on at the game, <laughs> but I mean, literally, yeah, that was the same thing. That that's the most I've ever seen Nick Saban smile, and like even listening to him during interviews, he just seems so much more happier. And like just this overall game for Alabama, this is. This is the most exciting that I've seen Alabama play and just watching them play just because, like you said, having having to come back and just hearing from what they've lost obviously going to last year and who knows what they were going to be looking up to this season. But Alabama is still 
they're still there and they're always going to be a team to talk about just because, I mean, like you always just said with Jalen Milrow running around like a chicken with his head cut off with stat wise and having, and being able to prove that much of a completion on the ground and through the air, that is unbelievable. And you look at a quarterback like that, Later down the road, he's definitely going to be a really good threat in the NFL just because you see a quarterback have so much different weapons and whether he's using his legs or using his talented arm that we've seen Jalen Milrow use game in and game out. I know obviously every week it's a little bit different in the right step just because Jalen Milrow right from the get go, he was it was a rocky situation, but. You even hear Nick Saban talk about how much progressive that he's gotten throughout the entire season. And just from looking at what they were able to bring against a really good LSU team, that's definitely something that is is able to be talked about for a while. But even look on the other side of the ball with LSU, obviously they knew they were going to be going against the obviously the Crimson Tide of Alabama. They were going to be into a dogfight here. Just but that's a big thing. You hold Alabama to halftime going in the same at 21 apiece that is a win in my book it, you come into that kind of a situation and environment where you're playing against an alabama team with a quarterback like that i sincerely would call that a win any day of the week just just being able to have key plays not being able to come up their way but losing obviously like you said mr magician getting exactly 42 points and saying hey i'm gonna score 42 points and bada bing bada boom they scored 42 points like i said yeah, i don't know saving and, and saving and, and Jalen milro heard me they were like hey josh said we got to score 42 points say. today guys uh let's, yeah, let's go 42 uh you know go, go out there and, and show up is there some is there a phone number like a direct line number that you have that you haven't told me about just because i don't know obviously a lot of people say the nfl is scripted but josh did you just script the college football game for the alabama Crimson i may have Tide? a little bit of a part in the script um i not, not knew the, it not the entire part because they won't let me control oklahoma uh obviously <laughs> so you know that's that's kind of disappointing but no i mean yeah. I, and, and here's the thing, too. I, I was listening to the media talk about Jalen Milrow, and I was kind of buying into it because I didn't have anything to, to say that I, you know, to, to really prove them wrong. But everyone was ragging on, on Jalen Milrow. He's a sophomore, and he's progressively getting better. We've heard Nick Saban say it. We can see it through the stats. We can see it in his playing ability. I, I see a similarity. I'm not going to compare him to him, but I see a similarity with Jalen Hurts in him. Because you see a guy that's going out there and just dedicated to to improving week in, week out. And we also look at Jalen Hurts in, earlier in his career. He wasn't much of a passer. He wasn't as good of a passer. And people kind of were, were dogging him for that. And we see that very similar comparison there. And so I'm, I'm not going to compare their their playing style or anything like that, that, that they're the, the same player or anything like that. I'm just saying I see a lot of progression the way that we saw from, from Jalen Hurts. Uh, and so I, I don't know. If personally, I, I think... I like Jalen Milrow, and I have from the get-go. I just didn't have anything to really support uh, my, my my stance, and I think it's starting to come to fruition. And and I really like what I'm seeing from him. I think I think he's showing up as a much better quarterback week in, week out, and we might see him progress to where next year, uh, if, if he's able to work on his passing game in the offseason and dial in on some things, I think he can be really dangerous. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you get those little itty-bitty things that we always talk about dialed in, um, you might want to you might want to check yourself after that kind of a game just because you talk about that kind of an aspect and what he's already been able to do and still having that much time left in the college football season not season in a college football career you you definitely might want to get your eyes checked because you definitely need to watch out for that kind of a situation here oh absolutely but man let's get to it let's get to our fan duel bets uh so we're rec recording this on a monday so we're actually taking our bets today for when you guys can see this on Tuesday, so that way you can't, uh, you know, accuse us of cheating anything like that. We're making our, our Tuesday bets. So we're doing this a day early. All right, so uh, give us a little bit of a break there. Uh, let me pull this up real quick. I had the graphic pulled up earlier, so let me see what it was. Uh, we're doing our standings based on uh, based on the winnings. So each bet is going to be a ten dollar bet put in on the on the game. Uh, and they're, they're going to be winning, so we're going to have a winner, uh, and we might even have something towards the end of, the, of each month too to for the winner. Uh, so we've got uh, right now the standings look like Blake is taking the lead really big. Uh, so I actually had to take some bets today to try to catch up here. So Blake is sitting there at plus eighteen point nine five. Uh, Jeremy's right behind him at plus one. 
and then I'm sitting there at minus 130, uh, minus one, uh, you know, a dollar 30. Uh, so, <laughs> so not, not a great start for me. Uh, Jeremy, you and I went one and one, Blake just went two and oh, and had some big earnings on that first, first, uh, uh, day of the month. But everybody, if you guys want to join in with us, these are our, these are our uh, picks pr- presented by FanDuel. You can go to rising com slash FanDuel, uh, and you can get signed up. And again, uh, that promotion right now is bet five dollars for one hundred and fifty dollar uh, in bonus bets instantly. So go check them out. You can get signed up there. It's a very fun way. I, I've actually been enjoying Fanduel and, and getting used to it. Uh, and I, I, it's one of my top, uh, you know, top sports books at the moment. So go get signed up for Fanduel. We're going to make our picks for Tuesday night on Fanduel. Uh, I'll start off with Blake's. He's got Auburn money line. Uh, I wasn't able to look up the odds yet on that, so I'll I'll get that together and piece that together and everything. Get that one ready to go, so we know uh, what his his odds would be for his winnings and all that for the standings. And then he also took Michigan minus eleven and a half. This is all in a uh, college basketball. So uh, he he took a little homer bet in, in Auburn. I almost took that, but I thought, man, I don't know if they're going to beat Baylor. Uh, so my picks are Rangers minus one and a half versus the Red Wings. The Rangers need this one. They've kind of they, they've gotten off to a good start, just not a great start. Uh, so I need to see them come out and not just win it by one. I need to see them win it by two, uh, and that's at plus one fifty five right now. So that can give me fifteen fifty uh, ahead. So hopefully I can get something there to help me out. Uh, and then I've also got the Kraken Coyotes over six and a half. The Kraken last year scored a lot of points, and right now the Coyotes are looking fairly decent right now. Uh, and so I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing from them. Uh, I think they can score over six points. So let's get that over six and a half at plus 102. So a couple of them in the, in the plus category for me to try to bounce back and, and get ahead of the game. And Two that I'm feeling pretty confident in. But Jeremy, what are your FanDuel bets for this fine Tuesday? My FanDuel bets for this fine Tuesday, I was stuck on the NHL side as well with you, Josh. I went with a money line for the Colorado Avalanche against the New Jersey Devils. And right now it's sitting at minus 178. But you look at Colorado, they're definitely showing really, really good starts for this year so far. I think last time I think they're maybe they might be seven and two. But you look at this Colorado team, they're definitely not one to sleep on. But same with the New Jersey Devils. If you if you catch them wrong, you're definitely gonna be on World of Hurt. Look at what they got. Obviously, Jack Hughes, then the the, his younger brother as well, both on the New Jersey Devils. Then, obviously, if you haven't watched NHL, Vita Vanacek making an unbelievable saves the other night. But um, my other pick I had overall as well. I did the over under versus the Pittsburgh Penguins versus the Anaheim Ducks, and I went with the under on this one, and that is at six and a half. And that is sitting at plus one hundred eight. So I'm gonna try and rack up some points here, but just I know. It's really weird for me to pick the under against the Pittsburgh Penguins just because of how much talent they have. But you look at this, you look at this, team and you look at the Anaheim Ducks. They're definitely not a team that you can just completely sleep on. So looking at this overall aspect, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go into the positives here and stick to, stick to hopefully maybe sweeping this one. So we won't find hey. out until tomorrow. Hopefully we get it. At least neither of you guys are uh, are in the negative right now, like I am. So. Uh, not, not by much, but just a little bit in the negative. And I'm kind of, kind of a little bummed about that. So maybe I need to start. Do uh, I need to know. throw, do I need to donate some money to you so you can be out of the negatives? Yeah. You know what? Maybe, maybe that's what we need, but no, it's, it's, it's going to be fun. Uh, so this, this month we're going to be using FanDuel. That's what we're, we're using for all of these bets. Uh, and so we've locked ours in on these. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look up Auburn and, and uh, Michigan there on Blake's picks right now. So we can lock him in at whatever odds he was picking those at. Uh, and then we'll also uh, get that graphic put out for you guys too. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram and X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, and then you can also go over to TikTok as well. We're posting a lot more on there. Uh, and then had a huge, huge boost in, in our TikTok following too. Uh, so, you know, just constantly putting stuff out there uh, for you guys. So if you want some more content from us and also keeping up with the show and keeping up with sports in general, go follow us on social media. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see more interaction from you guys. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, hit that subscribe button. You can also hit that like button. That helps us out quite a bit. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, go give us a five-star review. That's another amazing way to do that. Uh, we're, Jeremy, you got to keep me in check. we got to uh, read a few more reviews this week uh, so we will can do. put that out there. And uh, I will, so we, we will try to put another episode out on Thursday uh, if everything works out just fine for us. 
and then we'll see what we can do about a Saturday episode because I will be in Norman uh, going to another Oklahoma game. So we're going to see what we can do there. Uh, and then uh, Blake is going to be up in Eugene. So safe travels to him. Uh, hopefully everything goes well there and go Ducks. Um, but for everybody else, hopefully, hopefully you guys have a great rest of your week. I uh, can't wait for more college football and more sports in general, guys. We're in a, in a great time of season. So stay tuned. Uh, make sure you hit that notification bell if you want to know whenever we have more uploaded on the YouTubes. But guys, we thank you so much for all of your support. And until next time.